Okay. Um, roll, call, uh, roll call is all board members are present. The meeting will please come to order. Will you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I want to welcome all of the attendees at this uh, very important, I think, uh, uh, study session that we have. I'd like to uh, turn the program over to uh, Dr. Washer, please. Thank you, Mr. Nava, members of the board. I appreciate everyone who's tuning in to listen and participate this evening. Uh, this is a critical issue for us and we're um, glad that we're able to spend some time just focusing on this issue. I wanna set the frame a little bit very quickly for this evening. Um, this is a report item, so we are not expecting decisions tonight. Um, it is early in the process still. Uh, we want to share the discussions that have happened thus far regarding the um, start of the new school year. We would like board members to give us any input or ideas um, that they have that have not been talked about thus far or um, specific interests that you have to guide uh, the future decision making. We want everyone to keep in mind that there will be guidelines for schools coming in the very near future. We have been told by the state superintendent that the California Department of Education will be putting out guidelines for schools for the start of the school year. So it really would be premature to do any definite planning or decision making uh, prior to those guidelines. That is gonna be important for us to know what those are. We also need to acknowledge that this is a very fluid situation, continues to be, it has been all along, but we seem to be at a point where things are changing quickly. And we need to understand that if we make decisions um, prematurely, we may be faced with having to change those decisions. So we need to be flexible in our thinking and our planning um, and be able to respond quickly uh, if when things do change. It does seem like we're at that point where things are starting to change uh, more rapidly than before. We also um, are very interested in the issue of distance learning as an option for families, regardless of what other models or operational procedures are in place. Uh, we have heard from our families and teachers that this is um, an important issue and that uh, we'd like to hear from the board uh, about the idea of keeping a distance learning model in place uh, for families who choose that rather than um, having one model fitting all. Uh, Lisa Katowski is going to share um, what she has um, been working with the task force groups, some information from them and the ideas that they have been working on in terms of planning for the new school year. And Mr. Khan also has information to share uh, more about the operational and logistics of the business end of some of these things. Um, so we're gonna start with Lisa. She'll go through her presentation uh, and then there'll be time for board members to ask questions. Uh, we can then go to Mr. Khan and then the board can ask the operational types of questions. Uh, and then I'm sure that we will have comments from the public. So um, I would like to turn it over to Ms. Katowski. Okay, um, Dr. Washington, before Ms. Kotoski gets started, <clears throat> I like to have the report uh, in full, and I know you have questions at the end. Uh, we will have the opportunity for board members to ask questions first, and then we'll go out to the audience. So if we, if we will get the report ready and then write, jot down some questions that you have as the report's being read, and then we can ask I'll pull more members so they can ask their questions. Thank you, Lisa, you're on, you're on Lisa. Thank you, President Nava, members of the board, and Dr. Washer. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And I would like to uh, let you know that we also have some representatives from the three task force 
Uh, they are standing by to also be able to provide input um, or answer some questions. We have Mark Dawson and Jackie Heinrich recommending, uh, representing secondary the high schools, Janet Perez and Maddie Britt rec uh, representing middle schools, and Neil Young and Rachel oh, Flanagan representing elementary schools. So um, um, they've been on all of our meetings with us and uh, they can answer questions and share uh, additional ideas or thoughts um, that I may have, I may miss or not. So if we could go forward to the first slide. Edith, uh, can I do this or is somebody else gonna control it for me? Okay, so. I have it for you. Okay, thank you. So uh, as Dr. Washer said, we are uh, really just presenting the options of the instructional uh, model that our teachers have been talking about and and Dr. Washer is you know right spot on teachers are nervous parents are nervous they, everybody wants a wants a an answer and yet we don't have all the information to be able to get a, a full picture and provide everything um, that we need uh, to have our questions answered so we're going to talk about some models that have been discussed uh, one of the things that teachers stressed in the task force and through many of our other meetings um, was accountability for the work that the students are doing. And so we're going to talk about sample, uh, uh, maybe a sample accountability that we're using in summer school, how we're thinking summer school can help us uh, plan for next year. And um, even though we have talked a lot about disinfecting, hand washing, meal service, cleaning the classroom, transportation. That's really not something that we feel that we can address. There should be, once we kind of settle on a direction and figure out where we're gonna go, I think all of the departments can get together to answer those, uh, the appropriate departments can answer those questions. I'd like to share with you just uh, briefly who we have talked to. Um, we have taken a lot of input, of course, from the three task force groups. Um, we have talked to elementary, every elementary uh, PE and music teacher. We talked to all the secondary PE teachers. Uh, we've gotten responses from them. We've talked to or have been in communication with uh, every RSP and SDC teacher. We. Uh, communicated with the preschool and transitional kindergarten teachers as they were not on the task force. Uh, we've talked to career technical teachers, all of our site administrators, and of course, uh, the thought exchange uh, that we uh, spoke briefly about at our last meeting where we received lots of input from staff and community members. So, Based where on what we know right now, <clears throat> the health and safety guidelines, you know, uh, it appears that we can't come back to school as what we would call normal school. We have to uh, maintain a social distancing, which then would may, uh, make us have to change the numbers of students that come to school at a time. We've come up with some solutions that we'd like you to think about. And um, I, I'm try, I'll try to uh, be as uh, clear as I can. Uh, sometimes when I talk about these solutions, I, it gets muddy. So uh, please bear with me. Every option that we talk about, except for the hybrid model, means students will come into school at some point in time. The hybrid model is the model that we will talk about a little later, but it's what we're doing in summer school or what we plan to do in summer school in two weeks. Um, and kids are, students are not coming to school. The, all of the other models will have some form of children coming to class for an in-person class. Um, the task force has identified two options, uh, basically, bringing the groups in 50% of the time and 
or dividing the groups into 25%. So dividing your school population into 25 and having them cycle through or dividing the school into two, 50% uh, 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 and 50%. Go ahead, Edith. Uh, as Dr. Washer mentioned, we are also uh, uh, recommending a cyber option um, for, for full distance learning, um, operating something like the independent study mode. And when I use the word cyber, I am talking um, about online courses developed by an organization such as Apex, where they have all the courses developed, the children work independently from home, and the teachers monitor their progress, and take, they take tests and exit out. That's uh, the word, how I'm using the word cyber option. But it would be an independent model where children are working um, online. I already mentioned that the hybrid model is being piloted uh, during summer school this year. We have our high school teachers taking Lodi Unified courses of study and um, adapting it to an online course um, so that they can deliver the courses of study that the children would have gotten in the classroom all online. Um, part of the day would be uh, working with the teacher in a Zoom or a Google Classroom, and part of the day they would be working independently uh, on their own. One of the things that we'd like to make sure is that if, uh, when, I don't want to say if, when we are permitted to come back to full capacity, all of these options can be scaled up uh, rather easily um, to bringing all the kids back to school. And that was something that we really wanted to stress. We didn't want to go in an option where if at, in uh, September we could bring kids back and we had gone on down a path that wouldn't allow us to scale back up to, to full implementation too easily. So the options we bring, are bringing forth allow for an easy transition. So uh, you'll see in the next couple of slides, uh, a couple of versions of what I call the AMPM 50% model where 50% of the students come uh, in the morning and then the other half of the kids come in the afternoon um, and they all students would have two days of in-class instruction per week. We're thinking um, that in some cases in the high school, there would be between 14 and 20 students in a classroom. Some of our classes at high school are larger than of course, those at elementary schools. Um, the thought process would be that one day, possibly Fridays, students would continue to engage in, <clears throat> excuse me, remote learning activities, and it would give time for teachers to plan, uh, grade papers, review, prepare for the next week. I think the next slide you're gonna see is this type of model, um, how it would work at a block schedule at McNair. If you look at uh, period one on Monday, the students, uh, period one would come Monday morning, another group of students would come Monday afternoon, they would repeat on Wednesday, and uh, the afternoons would repeat on Wednesday. That's, that's one way we can think about it with Friday being um, the day where kids can get maybe some additional attention or the teachers could work on their class assignments, um, maybe a staff meeting or two. We don't wanna to take too much time from the teachers as doing in class and online is gonna add a lot of um, work to their schedule. The next one, you'll see how it would be done at a traditional Periods one, two, and three would come in the morning. Then uh, a group of kids from periods one, two, and three in the morning. The other side would come in the afternoon. Of course, if they're not in school, they're working on an online portion. They would come two days a week, just like all the others. If we can go forward. This is a different way of looking at it. <clears throat> um, and it would be alternating days all of Monday's kids come on 
no no a.m. p.m. It would all be 50% on every period on Monday, and then they would come back on Wednesday, and 50% would come on Tuesday, and they would come back on Thursday. So there wouldn't be children coming and going on the campus, which may lead to uh, having to clean rooms and, and disinfect rooms on an a.m. p.m. schedule, you would not necessarily have to do that at elementary, but if you're switching classrooms, you would have to worry about that at high school. We can go on. <clears throat> same thing, it would it pretty much looks the same for a 50% model at all the traditional K-12 schools. This was a, a, an approach that came from um, a couple of teachers <coughs> that uh, wanted to think about splitting the school up into uh, quarters. So we would divide the student population into four groups and students attend class one day a week versus, versus the 50% where they attend two days a week. Um, and it, it can be broken up into a couple of different varieties. What, what I've shared here is uh, the block schedule, a group, the 25% would come on Monday, 25% would come on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. <coughs> I'm sorry, I have a tickle in my throat that I can't get rid of. Um, and the same thing would happen with uh, the K, with all of the elementary schools, 25% the traditional schools, they would do the same thing. They would stay all day, only 25%. There's been discussion that they don't need to stay all day, that maybe they would uh, leave at noon and then be doing distance learning at home and the teachers would have the afternoons to work on some distant learning lessons, or it could be an all day thing, uh, all day where the students are working with their teachers. And then on Friday, they have their, uh, their day for planning and preparation. If you could go on. Um, when we put this together, I originally said we were still constructing sec elementary schools, but we were really discussing it. Um, the elementary schools um, had uh, like eight different models that they had uh, proposed. I'm um, worth settling down to the AM, PM, or the 50% model, 50% of the students come and 50% come the next day. There is an interesting concept of 50% of the students come and 50% stream at the same time uh, so that the entire class is being taught at the same time. Half of them are in class, half of them are streaming in like you would stream your Netflix or your Amazon. <laughs> there is a question that our youngest children need a lot of contact with their teachers to learn, uh, to do some of this uh, technology, how to log in and log out and just learn how to do school. Um, what we've heard from our elementary staff is trying to do distance learning solely like we have done this past quarter, quarter is unsustainable. They're working 24 seven, trying to you know, reach out and touch children every day. It's just really hard. Um, and they also want you to know that any model that brings school kids, students into, into school exposes the teacher to every student one way or another. So that teacher will be exposed to 24 or 34 students even though we would socially distance them, but that is a thought that they are concerned about their own well-being. Um, questions that we that that uh, we continue that might help us with some answers of, or direction is, you know, if you're going to school 50% of the time, you may not get through all of your standards. You may only get through 50% of your standards or 50% of an AP curriculum. Um, in, and so in those models where kids come partial of the time and not partial part of the time, it's not gonna be 
uh, I, I don't think we should expect our students to be 100% covering all of the, the content or the standards. There's going to be some slippage. Um, and we're wondering if the state will tell us that uh, we don't necessarily need to have the same amount of instructional time. Uh, you know, that they've recommended how much, how many minutes of PE over a two week period, if there will be a change in, in some of those minutes or change in the teacher day length. And will there be compensation if the day gets longer or shorter? Will there be any changes to the calendar? Some people are thinking maybe we should start two weeks later and take away some of those breaks. Uh, so that, you know, as Dr. Washer said, things are fluid. Give ourselves some time for the situation to kind of settle down. Um, and, you know, thinking of parents, we're wondering if how, uh, how parents will be able to adjust with daycare and how our teachers will be able to adjust with teaching and daycare and issues coming back and forth that their children are on a different schedule or do we look at a, dis a, a schedule or a model that fits the entire district or one that fits secondary better than it fits elementary. We really haven't gotten there yet. And we're hoping that we get some guidance from the CDE, uh, which I just heard Dr. Washer say it should be coming out uh, relatively quickly so that we can um, get, some, get some further direction. Uh, the summer hybrid model, we're hoping that uh, the teachers, we have quite a number of teachers I think we have 49 teachers teaching summer school and they're using our courses studies and we're hoping that we can gain some practical experience from that as they develop those courses and see what 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 was a success and what was a challenge for those virtual classrooms where the students never come into the school but are still getting credits and still working uh, with an accountability system within the four subjects. I, I, that's an exciting thing that um, I'm looking forward to, or I should say the district is looking forward to. Um, you know, uh, teachers will teach one course, uh, everybody doing everything virtually, they would be attending virtually and students would be working virtually. Um, and then will that be able to be a model that we can expand to when a teacher is teaching five periods a day or three periods a day. And that will be something that we learn as we, uh, within I would hope the first couple of weeks of summer school, we can get some feedback from our summer school teachers. Uh, our summer school teachers also uh, heard and value uh, an accountability system. I, I apologize that this is not very large, uh, but they put together a draft of what they're gonna share with their students about attendance and grading and when they have to log in and, and meet their teacher every day uh, because the accountability system is important for ensuring that students do check in, do do the work uh, and so that they can, their grade reflects the effort that they put into it. So we can use this, my thought was in the future, after a summer school, we can use this to see what was positive, to see what was a challenge, and then modify it for uh, use throughout the district because accountability, every task force has stressed, we need to make students accountable to coming to, to attending classroom and accountable to the work that they do. And this will be our first step that we can try. <coughs> and then, you know, I just thought it would be good for us to see what the CDC says about <laughs> opening of schools and, our, and their little flow chart uh, of, you know, when we can open schools, when we should stop and look and think about what are the, the safeguards that we need to think about or when we can move over to the next column. Um, because at my point, I'm at the point to where, uh, I would just like to reopen schools, but I know that's not going to happen. You don't know that, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. We don't know that. I'm sorry, Mr. Nava. Right now, we can't do that. How's that? Right, exactly. <laughs> thank you for thank you for catching that, Mr. Nava. <laughs> that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Lisa. I want to thank the uh, 
uh, elementary, middle school, and high school task force for putting all this time and coming up with some type of ideas and uh, models and uh, the board can look at and, and have questions on. Now, I would like for us as board members to have all the questions uh, and Alisa, you can direct the questions to the people that, that are on your task force or you can answer them yourself. I'm gonna start out with Mr. Kanaksa. Thanks, President Nava. Um, well, I got a whole bunch of them, but I, I'm so, having a hard time deciding which one's first. One of the things I do wanna know though is uh, using these various models, it didn't really say how long the periods are, how much face time is in the various models or are they all exactly the same if they are how much is it um maybe uh mark or jackie uh can answer for the secondary schools okay Let's start there um i can answer uh president nava members of the board okay, mark. Mark. Sure. Thank can you. you hear me okay yeah. yes uh, president nava dr washer members of the board in in the discussions with the task force um and in the this well, mostly in a discussion with the task force, we talked about um, the idea that the schedule really is is something that would come later as far as space time. Um, what we were looking to present were some some potential models or how the day would be structured, knowing that we would be getting some guidance later on about how long students would be in in class. When uh, we started to discuss these models, my thought was, they would be in class for that class period when they were there. For example, McNair on a four by four block, my thought was, well, my students, whatever model was selected, our students would come to school for that full 90 minute period. If it's the 50% model where there's an A and PM group, that model would come, the A group would come in the morning, the AM group would come in the morning for their two 90 minute classes. Um, they would go home and then the, the PM group would come in in the afternoon for their two 90 minute classes. Um, or be it the other way where if, if it was the 50% model where students, one group came Monday and Wednesday and the other group came Tuesday and Thursday, again, they would go their entire schedule for 90 minutes. There were some discussions uh, from one of the teacher models about shortening the length, shortening the length of the class periods. Um, they used the common planning day schedule as a, as a template. Um, and their idea behind that was to give students face time, but then give the teachers the time after that to um, be able to moderate or plan the distance learning, assess, uh, and everything that comes along with that. So I think it's there's a lot of options within those structures. There's a lot of options as far as how long, um, but I think a lot of that we're waiting on guidance from the CDE and as well as from from our board. Um, I don't, uh, Jackie, if did I miss anything in our discussions? Yeah, hi Gary and um, the rest of the board. To give you um, some idea, we did play with numbers, like what would a regular day look like at McNair and it's 90 minutes schedule. So if you were in for two periods that day, you'd be in two 90 minutes. At a traditional high school, it'd be about 56 minutes if you went 50, 50 or even the 25% model. But I do have to acknowledge there is a model out there that asks for 25% of the kids on one day a week, and then another 25% the next day, and having a common planning element to it. At a traditional high school, that would mean that it would be 36 minutes a period. And that if you went one day a week, you would see your first period for 36 minutes, um, second for 36, and it would go through the day like that. You would put in about three and a half, four hours, but it would be about 36 minutes a period. Now, Mark, what does your common planning period look like? I'm not sure your time. Well, our, yeah, our McNair CPT, we have CPT every Wednesday. So our CPT day schedule is I believe it's 75 minutes. I don't have it in front of me, but it's it, it's considerably longer. I wanna say 75 minutes. Um, so if, but our, since we have the CPT every Wednesday, it's an MOU that's voted on every year by our staff. Um, we're at a 122 every Wednesday as opposed to the once a month CPT. So we're a little bit different. Uh, Mark, Ms. Dawson, which uh, of these plans, because you you probably have more experience than anybody in the district with uh, 
this block scheduling, which one do you like? Which one gives us the, again, the most time with students and which one do you think is most successful? Uh, as far as most successful, I, I can't answer that because these are, <laughs> these are totally conceptual. Um, okay. As far as All which right. ones I like, I, I like the two models that have 50% of the kids in school, either the AM and PM model or the alternating day model. I think that that gives a um, considerable amount of face time kids in the seats. Um, it also, it becomes, um, a, a, makes the master schedule less of an issue because it's, it, it seems as simple as simply uh, cutting everything into a in half thirds and quarters, but it's it's not that simple when kids uh, have a lot of different needs in their schedule. So, um, be, so if we are able to have fifty percent of the kids on campus, which may or may not be possible, look at McNair with our with our enrollment of about eighteen hundred. We're looking at about nine hundred on campus at a time. At the other three high schools, they're over two thousand, so about a thousand. Um, I, I, that that presents other challenges, uh, depending on what the what the for, what the guidelines are for social distancing, things like that. But I think that either of the fifty percent models gives us gives our kids the most time in in front of their teacher and okay. would be would be most effective. Okay. Uh, in, in particular, things like a, a, a CTE class or maybe even a science class that's trying to run run an experiment, you would need to have you know, a, a good chunk of time to uh, to get anything done. So that, I, mean, I appreciate your, your input on that. Um, has anybody d talked to uh, athletic directors about uh, after school stuff or band and, and that in, in your uh, discussions? Um, in my discussions, no. I, I, we have talked with our CTE teachers. I did meet with my staff uh, I think 10 days ago to ask about some of their concerns, some of the things that they wanted to bring up. Uh, the, okay. the arts and the athletics didn't bring up specifics related to, uh, related to the models that we talked about. Um, our PE department did express some concerns that were general PE concerns. And okay. athletics, uh, I think that Athletics are in the same situation a lot of us are. We're waiting for guidance. So right. um, yeah. those discussions. Yeah, we're, all in the same boat. we're all in the same boat there, that's for sure. Mr. Okay, Kac well. Mr. Yes. Kac uh -huh. um, I did not talk specifically to our athletic director, but I have spoken to a few coaches. And depending on when the start and stop time of the day is, um, it really wouldn't affect after school athletics that tremendous I mean, depending on the parameters of when a day started and when it ended um, our band directors in a little bit different situation she has a seventh period class and that would be jazz band and i guess that would have to fit into one of the after school schedules and maybe she could run a seventh period multiple days i don't know but yeah those are some concerns we will would have to definitely address Okay, well, and I'll just close here with, um, uh, I have received tons and tons of emails and from, and most of them are very articulately uh, composed. Uh, some people, parents, you know, want the kids back in school full time. Some say, nah, no, don't send them back because it's too dangerous. So uh, I, I appreciate the amount of work that the task force has put into this and given us a lot of information. Uh, oh, one other thing I do think is absolutely important is the accountability uh, piece that you guys were talking about. Uh, it reminds me of the old John Kinsley day teach, teach a summer school. You know, where there there was a, a consequence for not not doing your job. So I, I appreciate that that's being a, a addressed also. So I'm sure there's other questions that's going to come along the lines. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, uh, Susan McFarland. Susan? I'm here, Mr. Nava, thank you. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Let me start first by thanking everyone on the task force. I can't imagine um, the heated conversations and trying to convey all of your um, sites, wants and needs in those meetings. So I thank you for your time and your effort. Um, and I'm hoping to see a lot of what you've worked on in some of these models. Having said that, um, I have a 
probably three sheets full of questions as um, Ms. Katowski uh, was speaking. So let me let me get down to what I would want to see. What I want is a model that has the most students in front of teachers in class. Um, so while that is the most appealing to me and the, what I want to see for our district, it also creates the other half of that equation of um, questions. Um, and I'll just kind of rattle them out here. I know I'm going to I'm going to. I'm just going to kind of laundry list and whatever ones you want to pick out of mind because I know my other board members are probably going to have similar ones. The first one would be um, great accountability, attendance accountability, and how do we work that in with accountability as it relates to technology? Um, no matter what model we do, I think if we don't have grades, we don't have attendance with the understanding of technology glitches and um, just learning glitches that we've already discovered through the model that we have now. Those are very um, concerning to me. The other part of it is how do we um, work with our special ed kids? Our, um, uh, how do we do our, um, our IEPs and um, stay in compliant with those? Um, electives, how do we do an elective with a modified day at like some of our, um, our like acting classes, some of the ones that need um, the AP science, some of the ones that need a little bit longer time to do labs. Those have me very concerned. Um, I also want to know, does this change any of our graduation requirements? Are we going to have to modify them? Um, I can't imagine any of these options starting or ending without a distant learning option for those people, those families um, and teachers that are not comfortable being back in the classroom. Do we have a model for our teachers and our students that aren't comfortable coming back at this um, at this time? And probably one of the ones that um, has me most concerned is how do we, I'm not going to say this, how do we, no, nah, I'll let one of my other board members, how do we, how do we start? And if we start with a certain format and we discover as we roll it out that the, the parameters change, are we locked in that model for an entire quarter or semester? Or can we pull back at any point on a Friday and say, we're back to regular classes on a Monday? Is that an option or are we going to see through a, through a quarter or through a semester? Those are some of my questions. I don't know if the right who to ask to answer those, or maybe those are just observations. Well, if you don't mind, you? I'll, go go ahead. Ahead. I'll go ahead and start with a few of the things I jotted down that you asked. Um, Thank you. One of them, the last thing you ask is about when would we return to some semblance of a normal model? And we're not sure. That would be based upon what the governor and what the state superintendent asked for, but some of the models. Uh, Mr. Dawson put in place, allow us that easy transition back that I don't know if it would come at a at a Friday, but we have definitely looked at it being built in that, okay, we do this for a quarter and then we reassess where we go from there. We'll probably know before the end of the quarter whether we'd be moving to a normal model, but we're in a position with some of the ones he set into place um, that we could very easily go back into a regular model with the kids, especially with us having, like let's say the 50% model, kids are already used to going to all of their classes. And in some of those models, they'd be going for a regular class period. So if we ever needed to remorph that, they wouldn't need a whole new schedule change. They already still have six periods. Okay, I, can, I, can I interrupt you for one second? So I guess what my, my, I need to tailor my question a little better. In other words, if the parameters change, which we know they are, it's, it's moving, it's fluid. If we get worse, do we have a back out model? And if it gets better, are we going to, would it be wise to stay till the end of a quarter, even though the state comes back and says, hey, you're ready to go at 100%? Would we, are we, in locking into one of these models, would that be our choice to stay in that particular model till we finish a grading period? I, I can try to answer that, Ms. McFarland. Thank you. I would say all of these models were based, are would be based on a school's existing schedule. So okay. it, to, to have the students start, say, whatever model is selected, if we go with a 50% model and just use October 1st as the date, which would be the end of the quarter anyway, if things changed and we were told school school could start back up on October 1st, then it would be a pretty easy transition to go back to the full day with the entire student body on campus at a time for the full schedule. Going the other way, I think we would be in a better position if 
things did close down again very quickly, we'd be in a better position than we were this last March for a couple of reasons. One is our teachers have done this. They've done a great job of finding, of figuring out how to do this in a very short time. And, you know, so the next time it happens, and we all hope that it doesn't, but if it were to happen again, they would, they would be in a better position. Also, if, so if some of the work is already expected to be done from a distance anyway, it would be a much easier transition to say, uh, if again, situation change, situation changes, say November, and we are forced to go back into a, a statewide shutdown, then the students would, have, teachers and students would have already been doing a lot from the distance, from a distance for several months. So that should be an easy transition. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Mrs. McFarland, you had a question about electives, and yes. as a member of the task force, I I've taken this real seriously, and I have contacted my ag teachers. I've contacted my face department, which formerly was known as Home Ec, but my family and consumer education teachers. Um, I'm an AP teacher myself, and I've talked to some of my colleagues who also teach AP. And to be honest with you, they. I, I understand there's concerns about how many kids are on campus per day. Most of them said they could make a one day a week model at, with at least 56 minutes work. It's not ideal, it's not even close to ideal. But they said what worked best for them is if they could get two days of FaceTime with kids that with their curriculum, they could build enough online stuff that they could do the hands-on things that needed to be done in certain elective on the days they have kids for a normal period and then they could um, at that point post some of the other stuff online that they could work with there. I know personally I teach AP psychology it would be rerouting what I did in class um, and putting some of that online but there's definitely concepts that I need time to go over with kids that I, I need to work with them and for me personally, as an AP teacher, I could get through the curriculum with two days a week, even if it was an extended year of doing this. I'd have a pretty tough time covering my curriculum and keeping some kind of accountability if I had them just one day. That doesn't mean I can't be flexible. I'm not trying to push one issue. I'm just kind of verbalizing what my, what my concerns would be as an AP teacher. And that's kind of the same things I've been hearing from my AP US history teacher and my government teacher. And um, they've been saying that probably two days a week, they could get through what they needed to working with an online element also. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, any, any other questions, uh, Susan? No, I just would like to express my um, want of a distant component with whatever we do for the parents and the students and the and the teachers um, who aren't comfortable coming back yet. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Porter. Thank you, Mr. Nava, how are you? Hi, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the people that were on the task force, the high schools, middle schools, and elementary for all their work and the admin that was involved. And uh, I, I appreciate their efforts. I know tonight we're kind of just looking at different um, designs and so forth. I do have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I want to emphasize um, what, what, what Lisa called cyber learning. Is that correct? If you're talking about like Apex, yes, yes. that's correct. Okay, uh, on your cyber learning uh, that you also want to roll out in addition to these models, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so we'll have a K through 12 cyber learning um, program for parents that are obviously concerned about the fact that might not be any therapies available or a vaccine and they're not comfortable coming back to school or it could be they just are more happy with online, right? Um, I would like to qualify that, that I'm very positive seven through 12 we can deliver um, I would need to do investigation uh, on the K-6 side. Uh, I do know that we would be able to do an independent 
um, learning for those students, whether or not it be uh, Apex courses or not, the teachers are committed to being able to deliver something for those parents that <coughs> are uncomfortable sending their children back or, or for the teachers that have underlying conditions and would prefer to work from uh, in a distance. Okay, thank you. Um, my one question is with Apex. Now that is a program that is self-generating, is that correct? Where the student does the work and keeps going on the computer. Correct, it is a, it's, it's built by the Apex organization. They build the course, the students work through the course um, as they work through, you know, uh, the next activities and, and um, now how much lessons. is one license for the Apex? Uh, hmm, I wasn't prepared to answer that. Uh, right now, of course, everything is a deal. We have currently 250 licenses for the district. I, I believe maybe it's more than that. Um, is that for summer school, Lisa? That's for summer school and for credit recovery. We right. do use Apex for credit recovery during the school year. And then we turn those licenses uh, over to summer school. Um, a license can be used by multiple students. When a, class, when a student finishes a, class, a course, a new student can take that same license. So we can use it six times in a year once a student finishes a course, a new student so logs six, in, that six kind of thing. Six times is a max, right? Per license? Um, <laughs> so I'd have to investigate. Uh, right now, the thing that they told us, of course, it's for June 30th, would be like $5 a license. That is not what they charged us before. Um, it's probably more like $40 a license. Well, okay, speak. and then you're gonna couple that with FaceTime with teachers, is that correct? Yes, uh, what, what they do during the summer school is the teachers monitor and check in with those students, how are they doing through their, their, their online course. So they do get FaceTime visually through the computer, not in person. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I thank you for that. Uh, I'm looking at next year for you know for the school year. Oh. So if we're doing the cyber part or the hybrid, is that correct? Hybrid regular time during the regular school year. You said you were offering that. Is that correct? Right now, um, the uh, I'm I'm talking summer school. The hybrid is where the teachers are building the courses themselves. Okay, and that's it's all what virtual. What I think they could turn that into in-class time and distance learning in the fall. Yes. Okay, that's that's what I want to talk about. I okay. I think, and um, this is my opinion, not of anybody else on the board. I think that should be the number one thing we work on right now. We look at all these models, but I think we need to offer to the community that we are going to have K through 12 a program set up for uh, remote learning with teachers giving FaceTime and so forth for those students that do better with remote learning and for those people that are apprehensive given that at the present time, you know, today, there are no therapies, there are no um, vaccines for COVID-19. And that way we might capture a lot of people that might be looking at alternative forms of education. I think our district needs to be very nimble on that and this is my feeling that would be the first thing we need to do is ensure that we're going to have that program. Can that be done? Lisa, <laughs> did you pass out or? Yeah, I think you made me <laughs> fall out of my chair. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sure how fast we can scale that up. I'm sure that we can do some amount of work over the summer um that's a big task and uh you know i'd have to see who we could get to work for that uh but I've, I, I, I know that you're retiring and congratulations yes. but um uh, i this is me personally and i'm going to express this to the board at a board meeting that we need to have a remote learning program in place before we start next year so thank you on that Mr. My other, yes my other concern was um you know, um, the distance learning or the cyber portion of it may be something that would be a good um, springboard point for the people who are working on the summer school program who are already putting those things in place for summer. So that may be something 
that kind of moves as a natural progression out of that what's going on this summer because i yeah. know there's regular I'm putting I'm that okay i'm sorry rick I'm, I'm sorry i guess i cut you off my only concern is the apex i'm not real most teachers aren't a big fan of it in terms of being very progressive i think teacher <laughs> development teacher FaceTime would be yeah. better than an apex program that's just me um, I, don't, I, I agree with you that summer could be a springboard for that type of program so yeah. thank you on that uh, the other thing go ahead i'm sorry i'm sorry um i was under the impression from the people i've spoken to who are on the summer school committee that it is only going to be a one or two apex classes of credit recovery and the rest of them are teacher created curriculum um as and run as a regular class like Daniel Holmes is going to be running a social studies class, and I believe he is writing his own online curriculum. And outstanding, outstanding. That's the thing I'm looking for. So thank you for that. That's a great, great that we're using. I mean, I know that Apex was part of it, and I kind of, I kind of gloss on the fact that a lot of teachers have developed already major portions of their curriculum for online, and some of those will be in that, doing that this summer. Mm -hmm. and Use that as a springboard for remote learning. Thank you for that. That's a very good comment. Okay. The other thing I was curious about, maybe Ms. Heinrich can answer this, is what about videotaping in the classroom and shooting that live to pick up other days uh, given your different models? You know, um, I'm going to be honest with you. There are concerns about that. I, I've talked to people who are concerned. Who um, live streams this? How does a teacher, while they're teaching the class, help maybe possibly put out potential um, problems that could arise with a live streaming situation? I'm sure there's yeah. answers to it. I don't know those answers. I was one of the people who had concerns, and I've kind of put the question out there. I would love, I would love to know how this would happen. I'm sure there's answers. I just know I couldn't myself while trying to teach and trying to monitor. Yeah, and I was just wondering if you go to and the stationary the, yeah. camera. But then again, you're looking at privacy issues privacy as well. Is, yeah. And, and how do you I make sure people aren't on camera that shouldn't be on camera at any given time? So oh, I, I understand we'd have to have waivers and so forth. I was just curious if you looked at that as a way to increase the amount of uh, education in your uh, models we have and there are definitely people on that committee who are much better experts at this than myself i know for example janae montalongo she she knows a lot about those type of things and so she would be way more of an expert about that than me okay so thank you my next my next question is did we did anybody consider us starting later with our regular schedules uh, Mr. Porter, when you mean starting later, are you talking about starting like at 10 o'clock in the morning or are you talking about starting like September 1st? Very good question. I was saying that as we learn more about the virus and we, we're learning more each day and we'll probably get more updates from the CDE, it might be prudent for us to lose the two week breaks and start later in July, early August and give us more time to come up with uh, um, a more feasible plan for learning. Uh, we might not have to go to these models. We might have to, but by giving us more time, um, it would allow us for a little bit more expertise in deciding which way to go. Did anybody look at that? We did discuss that. Uh, we discussed uh, maybe modifying the school year to eliminate those. Uh, those are, uh, questions uh, that would need to be negotiated. Uh, there was a lot of support to delaying the start of school if we could negotiate a, a delay of starting school. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, it, it would have to be negotiated and we all love doing that. Um, to me, there's nothing more powerful than the, the teacher in the classroom for learning. And so I, I agree with you that the more teacher time that we could have, the better off we are. So I. I like your emphasis on that. I think uh, I think that's been outstanding. That, uh, that's the powerful tool. And the other thing that I'm just going to bring up, and maybe this is off the top, 
if Mr. Dawson can answer this for me. Mr. Dawson there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Mr. Dawson, uh, we have three schools that are on regular traditional uh, high schools and you are on block scheduling. Wouldn't this be a good time for McNair to shift and go to a regular schedule and phase out? I know Folsom um, School District is doing away with their block scheduling altogether. We found that the results, test scores, learning uh, have not improved under block scheduling and that the more traditional measure, measure is better. And Folsom is a little bit more of a, a, a upscale area, so to speak, social economically, but yet they're, they're getting away from block scheduling. Why would we keep this at McNair? Tell me why. Um, for in the situation we're in right now, I would argue that the block schedule is much more conducive to any sort of a hybrid, any sort of an AB, uh, any sort of an AB, AM, PM model that we're looking at. If, as we're talking about more teacher time, if we were on a traditional day, even on, if we were looking at the 50% model where students came two days a week in each class and had that uh, Friday for distance learning, uh, as of now, under each schedule, they would be in each class for a total of 180 minutes per week. As at a traditional high school, you're cutting that down to 114 minutes. So if you're talking about the more teacher time being, um, more teacher time, more teacher student time being key, I would argue that the block schedule is much better for this. Um, so I, I would say that if we're looking at this, I, I would, I don't think it would be a good idea for McNair to go away from it. Well, now at this point, you're saying, okay, thank you. Then my last, I, I said that was my last, I got one more. Which model was it where you had 56 minutes twice a day they met? Well, at, Mc, at McNair, I could, only, I could, well, I could speak for all of them. Class so, meeting twice for 56 minutes. Right. That would have, well, I don't don't know that there was one. I know that on one of, the, yeah, uh, one of the fifty one of the fifty percent models. Um, again, we did talk about the fact that the time in class it could could change and, and may change based on what different guidelines come down. Um, however, on the AM PM model, students would be in class uh, at McNair a total of one hundred and eighty minutes a day. They would go to their first and second period on Monday in the morning their third and fourth on Tuesday in the morning, their first and second again on Wednesday in the, in the morning, and their third and fourth on Thursday in the morning. And if then, I'm on period one, I would go 56 minutes in the morning and then 56 minutes later in the afternoon? No, the, the, you, would go, you would go to a 90-minute period, first period, you'd go to a 90-minute period, second period on Monday, then you would go home, then that PM group would come in. And then you would come to the next day, you would come to your third and fourth period uh, in the morning. Um, and then you would go, you'd go to your third and fourth period for 180 minutes, then you would go home. I'm looking um, at one of your models right now. You have period one, two on Monday, period one, two in the afternoon. Right, but those were two different groups of kids. So if you're thinking about it as an A group and a B group or an AM group, or an AM group, group and a PM group. For, okay, so you have a, you have half the group coming in in the morning for 90 minutes for period one? Yes, and, and then they would go to period two and then they would go home. And then the, the PM group would come in during third period. Yes, Sorry, sir. the PM group would come in in that Monday, they would go to their first period and second period, then they would go home. The yes, other, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, you asked about the 56 minutes. That's roughly what a normal high school class period is. And so it would be on the AM, PM. You would go one, two. No, I got you. I got you on that. I thought I had heard where you would go 56 minutes in the morning, and then you turn around and do the same class again later, 56 minutes. But maybe I wasn't listening properly. If, Mr. Porter, if I may, I think they were talking, I think that that was from the teacher standpoint where the teacher would teach their first period and their second period in the morning with one group, and then they would teach the same first and second period with that PM group coming in. And the, PM group the PM group would be different. The PM group would be a different group. Yes. Yeah, you see you're cutting it in half. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your effort. I appreciate it. And again, I want to reemphasize that I think we 
need to have a program in place, Lisa, for all the people in the community showing them that we are going to have a napkin, please. I'm sorry. Oh, I apologize. No, I might have cut it. I don't have a napkin sorry. available. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I thought I covered my <laughs> microphone. A remote map napkin. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a virtual one. Um, I really think that our, our after tonight, though, that we should go ahead and put main emphasis on remote learning provided to the community for um, the up and coming school year so parents could buy into it now, feel safe, feel comfortable, and then go with that. The other models that we looked at are great. A lot of information here to look at and go over, and I've done some of that. Um, but again, there's there's nothing better than the FaceTime. Uh, I, I think uh, you've done a great job, and I really appreciate all your support. Okay, thank you, Mr. Porter. Uh, Mr. Heberly. Yes, Mr. Nava, thank you. You bet. Uh, several of my questions have already been answered, um, but there are a lot. Um, but I'm not going to use them uh, all the questions tonight because this is, after all, just an introduction, um, but there were a few points that I did want to make, and one of them is is that I think that the use of the task forces um, is really a great model to do because of their obvious perspective, because that's that's the world they are, that's where they live, and they are closer operationally to to know what could work and what would be very difficult. Um, so you know even between elementary, middle, and high school, there are differences, obviously, between those groupings. But even within um, each one of those groupings, there are so many things, and some of them were brought up uh, this evening, um, you know, between the different uh, classes there are, you know, and of course, one of them is, um, you know, science, where you have lab uh, requirements for some of those. And of course, the higher level science you have, the more lab time you have. So, um, you know, that obviously is a consideration as an example. So anyway, that uh, I, I really appreciate the task forces that um, are kind of, I mean, you guys are giving us your all and I really appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I had a question on was, was moving from one model to another, um, Either way, whether things opened up or things get more restricted, and those have already been answered, and, and I think that's great. Uh, one of the things that Lisa presented right off the top was, um, you know, mentioning a little caveat there that concerns about disinfecting and hand washing and, and meal service and all those kinds of things, transportation, those come from within the departments. Those are all uh, obviously really important things too, because they're finding now even more so than social distancing is that um, washing your hands, keeping your hands off your face are far more effective than uh, social distancing for prevention. And, um, and so whatever we do, and, and I've obviously said it before, and it's just cleanliness is one of those things that's really near and dear to my heart because that is, you know, health and safety. Um, so whatever we come up with, we've got to think about, the, you know, those things that uh, we're on page two. Um, so moving moving forward, um, another comment was made about FaceTime, uh, you know, personal contact FaceTime with, with the teachers. Uh, there, in my opinion, is nothing that can replace that. Uh, that in the human contact instruction is to me paramount um, i have no problem with you know the component of distance learning and and i am also like what mr porter said i agree is that we whatever we do whatever operational model or plan that we use um, there needs to be that distance learning um, element to it uh, I, I think we're just kind of on the cutting edge. I shouldn't say cutting edge, the beginning edge in our district on that. And we should uh, definitely um, pursue those. I think that that's probably the only thing that, that I would say 
for me tonight would be a direction is that that is um, a, a really a way to go two models of that whether it's teacher our teacher generated and also um, you know the the individual or independent uh, models I think that's something that we should look at but um, in regards to the to the schedules um, yeah I've got there's some I like more than others um, one of the things that really concerns me and this is out of our control is that you know if we're looking at a quarter that's uh, I'm guessing they're right around nine weeks um, you know we're, we're going from 45 days to a possibility of 18 days uh, FaceTime and and I think that that's that's really a horrible thing myself um, I, I think that and probably the younger the kids are the more that that FaceTime is needed um, so you know I really appreciate these models that that have come up um, and and I think we'll get there and really my my questions at this point have either been answered or I will hold them uh, because there is a lot of work to do and it's said numerous times that you know holy cow this is really a truly a moving target um, but I do like that we're planning a variety of scenarios because we just don't know what's coming down the pike and I'm extremely hopeful that by by um, the start of school um, you know we'll even have that many more answers uh, I mean like Mr. Porter said you know we're, we're learning more about the virus every day and um, you know you just have to watch your sources um, I I like the CDC however they're they're weeks behind other health agencies they're 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 a big organization they're they're very slow um, to to come out with recommendations I think their recommendations are good but they're typically weeks behind what other agencies are coming out with um, so you know it a lot of it depends on where all that's going so anyway just to wrap it up um, I, I really appreciate the thought behind this there just by going over this you can see that people really truly are trying their best to make whatever they can do uh, better for for students so just a huge thank you for that. Um, and like I said, my other questions, I will hold for a different time. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Heberling. Uh, Mr. Neely. Thank you, Mr. Nava. Uh, first of all, I want to start off by thanking everybody on the task force. Uh, you guys have done a fantastic job. Uh, tough, tough task. And we still got a lot ahead of us. So, uh, I've got several questions here. I want to start off with the question, have we done an evaluation of how much of our staff is in uh, the greater risk groups? And the reason I ask that is because that's going to affect the amount of time that we're going to have uh, that they're going to be spending with the students. We may have some that don't need to spend any time. So has anything been done on that? Dr. Washer? Mr. Nava, members of the board, um, we do have folks um, who have communicated with personnel at various levels uh, based on, you know, requesting sick leave. But as far as a tally of who is in that category, um, we don't have that because nobody has, in terms of certificated teachers, they're not coming reporting to work every day. Or they're not reporting to their work site. They're working from home, so it hasn't been a regular ongoing um, issue uh, in terms of us tracking that. So I would say we don't have a number to give you or a percent to give you at this time. Okay, and, and that, that's fine. I understand that. Thank you for that answer. Uh, but what I would think that we should do is probably try to find out that number as early as possible. Uh, because the worst thing to do is to have the task force do all of this work, come together as a model, and we don't have enough teachers to fill up because we've got we've got it out for various reasons. Uh, 
The second question I've got is about passing periods. I understand that LA Unified, uh, instead of having students move between classes, are having teachers move between classes uh, because they're concerned about the interaction of students uh, during those passing periods. Um, what do you see a passing period looking like, Mark? Um, that's, we did discuss that when I met with the staff about 10 days ago, and we talked about a couple of different options. Uh, one of them is setting up a, a traffic flow like we see at some of the middle schools where students go just one direction um, rather than passing each other in the halls. We talked about the possibility of staggering passing periods, but uh, in all honesty, I don't know what that would look like if we <coughs> still have a bell schedule. Um, I think if we have fewer kids on campus, that will help and, and allow for some of that distancing. And the AMPM model does provide time, uh, a break in between to be able to, to clean and sanitize. Um, outside of initial discussions, we haven't had a lot about what passing periods could look like, to be honest, but we, one of the things we did talk about was changing the flow of traffic. So everybody went the same direction and that would help people from, uh, keep people separated a little bit. Uh, okay. If I may, if I may in, uh, jump in, Mr. Neely, <clears throat> we did talk a little bit about children staying in their room, in a room, and the teachers move. Uh, that works for some of our uh, high school population, but it doesn't work for like a science teacher uh, who mm -hmm. needs a lab. It doesn't work for like a math teacher. So it works in some cases with the children staying in a room, but not with uh, some of the core subjects. So do you think you might do it partially or, or not at all? I, I, I'm not. I, that's a scheduling kind of thing. I don't okay. know that uh, the magic, the magic work of a scheduler could figure that out. Um, Mr. Neely, I, this is Kathy. I just want to also say that in the high school setting, uh, the students are not in cohorts in their classes. So yeah, first period group does not all go to the same second, doesn't all have the same second period. They don't all have the same math class, the same, uh, they're not in the same, um, levels of, of courses in the core content areas. They have different electives. So um, they don't move like a grade level in elementary. They're they're going all different places. Gotcha. No, I, I understand. I was in high school once about 50 years ago. Uh, so, uh, okay, next question then. Uh, and Mark, you brought it up. You, you brought up about the clean and sanitize and disinfect. Do we really have the capacity to do that? Um, not so much a question for you. That's a question for Dr. Washer. But as it, as we develop these models, if we're going to include that in it, we need to be sure that we can actually accomplish that. Yeah, I would say if, if we're talking about common spaces, uh, restrooms, cafeterias, I think we do. If we're talking about classrooms every day, I uh, that would be more challenging. Um, Based on what I've seen. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Neely. Um, Mr. Khan has uh, has um, looked into that. So, if you want to ask him now, or if you want to wait later for his piece, um, that's up to you. What I want is, is for us to take that in consideration as we build the models. We've got some people who are working very hard building these models, and if they build it in there and we don't have that capacity, then we waste the time. Mr. So, Neely. Yes. Um, just kind of speaking from a high school perspective, with the way the classes are set up right now, um, with the number of desks we have in there, it would be feasible to have seating um, charts done that you didn't have kids sitting in at least the same desk as somebody the period before. So there would be a way, um, if we all took our Keenan training, that we could disinfect the desktops and that um, because we have enough desks in a room that if you had 12 to 15 kids, you could you could do a cursory sanitization of it if you had the things available to you through the school, like um, Clorox wipes and things like that. But again, I know we all have to keen and train to be able to use those, but it could be an option. We do have the space yeah. in rooms. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next question, let's talk. Uh, about the hybrid model here that uh, is going to go on summer school. 
how many students are you going to put with one teacher using the hybrid model? In summer school, the uh, um, the the courses are packed. They've got up to forty students in there. Um, only because right now, you know, students sign up for summer school and some don't necessarily need it. They've gotten their credits, so they drop out. Uh, but they're trying to do it with as many students as possible, like a traditional summer school would happen. So they're okay. packed with 35 kids in a classroom. Okay. All right. Um, next item, uh, I heard today that uh, tomorrow the governor's going to be announcing that. Uh, as students return to school, uh, they should be wearing masks. So I'm going to throw that out there. Uh, I just put that down in my notes here that I can talk about. Uh, let's talk about these models, the, the four-day model. I'm, I'm a fan of that. I've always been a fan of that. Uh, back when we had our last financial crisis, uh, we did a lot of checking on going into a, a four-day model. Uh, and one of the things that we started out with was also Fridays uh, open. And then as we checked around and checked at some other schools, a lot of people were going with the, the Wednesday option, Monday and Tuesday uh, in class, Wednesday, work at home day, not, not a day off, but a work at home day, and then Thursday and Friday uh, back in the, in the classroom. And as I talked to some of the other schools about that, uh, one of the issues was is that they had started with the Friday off and it, you know, when you don't have a schedule on a Friday, sometimes people tend to, to pick that up as a three day weekend when it's not really. Um, so that might be something to, to think about. We could split it up like that, it's a possibility. Um, one of the issues, I gotta tell you, I've never received so many emails with such varied opinions since I've been on the board for nine years uh, on, a, on a single subject. Uh, one of the things I hear from a lot of parents, they want their kids back in school because they need to, to go on with what they do as well. They can't afford child care, a lot of our, our, our parents can't. So one of the things that we do as a school, besides providing education, is we also provide uh, monitoring of those students during that time period. So we're going to need to think about a way, particularly in the... Uh, K6, K8, uh, of providing those services for our community and our, our kids as well. Those lower grade kids need more time with the teacher. So if we did, uh, let's say we, we took that model where you do half in the morning and then half in the afternoon. Rather than those kids leave campus, let's say they all come at the same time, half of them go to the classrooms and the other half go to other areas where they have access to the internet and things that they can do. So I, I'd like you to consider that possibility as well. Uh, and also, uh, one of the things that came up uh, when I was talking to some people was uh, the use of Google Classroom. Uh, it seems that we ought to make Google Classroom a standard across the district. Uh, it's a good program. And if we can come up with just one program, and that way parents can learn that, and they can use it on their third graders just like they can their, their 10th graders. It's the same program. Uh, and once you know how to use it, it's, it's great. I've been helping my granddaughter out in, in Michigan uh, through Google Classroom, and it works really, really well. So if we can give some consideration to that as well. Um, on the distant learning, Apex, I've used Apex. I've used it as a teacher. Um, it's all right. I, I don't think it's the best program out there. And I think that if we're going to go into this seriously, we need to start looking at some of the other options available to us. Uh, when I taught at the All Digital High School, uh, that's what we did, and we found there were programs that we chose over Apex. So I think we need to, to take a look at that as well. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to save that question to the end here. Uh, I agree on the live streaming. 
I think that that is, we, we got to be very careful with that. Uh, I also agree that we need a strong digital alternative for parents who don't want to send their kids there. And if we do that, typically the younger grades don't have, uh, Apex doesn't have anything for them and, and some of the others don't either. Uh, we can make those programs up, but I would think that we want to make them up from the district and make them available to teachers. There's no sense in every first grade teacher uh, coming up with an online lesson for the same thing. If we can give them a, a core, a, a base to work from, then they can take it and modify it however they want and present. But at least they won't have to do all the basics that would be done for everybody. All right. Final thing I want to talk about, I want to ask is what are we going to do if we have a case? We thought, I mean, I know we've thought about that. We have to. But what do we do if there's a if there's a case at a school? Has anybody got a just a brief idea of what we're going to do? Can you tell me? Dr. I think that's a Dr. Washer question. The task force has well, they yeah. talked about it, but we haven't really discussed. Uh, you know, right. I mean, this is Kathy. The the model that you know we've been using now, of course, we don't have students on campus. Is that um, if there is a need to do a thorough disinfecting, that we um, take the time to do that. So if that can be done during the off time, that's fine. But if it can't, uh, then we would need to suspend anybody coming on that facility until there can be a deep cleaning. All right. All right. My final thing here is the final concern is that I, I, people have been also writing me and telling me, say, we, we've got no cases here in, in Lodi area and things are going great. We need to reopen the schools. But it could be that one of the reasons that we've got so few cases is because we have been doing a good job of social distancing and cleaning and, and that kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of like having high blood pressure and then taking medication for it and the blood pressure comes down and you quit taking the medication because you no longer have high blood pressure. You know, we, we've got to be vigilant uh, about this. And uh, knowing that if we're not careful, we could see a rise and a spike in this. So I urge that whatever plan that we come up with, that we include in that, uh, that factor of safety. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neely. Mr. Freitas. Thank you, President Nava. Um, I would like to thank uh, the task force and all of our speakers tonight, uh, even the ones that we haven't heard from, like Mr. Young. I'm sure he's out there somewhere. But uh, I really would like to thank uh, Lisa. Uh, I was in a parade celebrating her retirement this afternoon. So she is truly doing this out of the goodness of her heart since she is no longer a district employee and has been volunteering her time here tonight with all this great information. So, um, which I'm not surprised, Lisa, your dedication to the mission and our kids has been always first and foremost. And uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, say how much I greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mr. Freitas. But uh, my last day with the district, I hate to correct you, is on June the 12th. Today was just the day so that people could say goodbye to me. Uh, I, I would love all those accolades that I donate so much time, but uh, I'll be around for two more weeks. You can't get rid of me that fast. Well, we have a saying at court, you know, why let the facts get in the way of a good story? Yeah. So, you know, okay. so. but anyway, congratulations all the same. Thank you. I'd also like to uh, thank Mr. Dawson, Principal Dawson, for being here. Uh, his school's graduation started 25 minutes ago. And uh, that's quite a bit of dedication here. But uh, after a long day doing the drive through uh, uh, acknowledgement of all the seniors. So thank you, Mark. Uh, and, and of course, your dedication doesn't surprise me either. Thank you, Mr. Freitas. Uh, I appreciate the kind words. I also like to thank all my colleagues uh, whose uh, good questions and, and great ideas I, I uh, appreciate and, and endorse and have really limited uh, many of my comments which uh, it seems to me that we have a problem that we didn't create and the solutions are very much out of our control. And that the rules and the policies are being dictated to us by so many other individuals. 
other agencies, the state, county officials, uh, even national officials. But uh, you know, a certain amount of truths do seem to be uh, uh, very self-evident. One, uh, it's gonna cost much more for us to open our, our uh, schools and get our students back into them. And second off, we're gonna be given much less budget-wise to do this. And I, I'm sure I'm not stealing Mr. Khan's thunder, uh, but uh, we, we are gonna have very uh, large challenges in front of us. And I'm sure that uh, the challenges that we have are going to come from uh, the task force that works with the same innovation and determination and wisdom that we've seen before. Uh, a couple notes I was uh, noticing, uh, as the task force sounds right now, uh, there is no members from LPPA and CSEA on the task force. And I, I think both of those uh, would have valuable input to both, to uh, all of our uh, uh, decision making. So uh, I would look forward to uh, their input on the future task force. Um, I also uh, promote, um, it, it's hard for us, I think, to uh, pick one of the models right now without hearing more from our stakeholders. So I would like to hear that uh, from our parents, from our uh, uh, employees, our teachers, our counselors, as to how these options, uh, the pros and cons, and from them uh, as we get closer to uh, keeping these options. I also like that we have a variety of different strategies that are uh, able to there. Um, I, I like the idea of keeping a distance learning option going forward for parents who uh, want a homeschool option and uh, would be able to have live teaching. I, I do have a, a couple of concerns. Uh, if we went to one of the alternating uh, models where kids came one day and didn't go the next day, uh, how would we feed the kids that didn't go to school? And that doesn't have to be answered right now, but uh, I mean, it's it just one of the things that came across to me. Um, and uh, I also see that these models are, are quite a bit like applying college scheduling to our high schools. And I think there's pros and cons with that. Um, and I, I could see why we want to do that. But I think whatever we do is going to have to involve screening. It's going to have to involve testing. Uh, of individuals, there's going to be monitoring, training, cleaning, and sanitizing. And uh, whatever we end up deciding upon, that we have the safety of our kids and our Loda Unified family uh, put first and foremost. So, um, and uh, I, I think some very important concerns were brought forward that we're going to have to work with equities for our English learners our children of poverty, our special ed, so that they will receive the full educational uh, uh, opportunities. Um, and that was the, uh, those were the notes that I had. Thank you, President Nava, and thank you everyone for speaking here tonight. Um, I, I look forward to hearing more information uh, going forward. And thank, thank you. The, Thank the panel for their work. Thank you, Mr. Freitas. Again, I, 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 as I thank you at the beginning, all the task force for their great work. I know that uh, we're speculating right now. Uh, as you know, the superintendent is planning to release a guidance on opening schools early in June. Now, he might have some different guidance. And Mr. Neely, I think he might be able to answer if, what if somebody gets gets the virus, what do you do? You know, those type of things and those type of questions. Uh, again, uh, we didn't talk very much about the elementary school. Uh, in a minute, I'm gonna ask Mr. Mr. Neal to give us some input on that. But to me and to all of us, the PISS model is to go back to normal. And I know the are, uh, I would say the parents that contact me, 50% of, of the parents says go back to normal, and I haven't heard of the other 50%. So it's it's a it's a trying situation. Um, Mr. Neal, uh, elementary, what do you perceive? Is Neil Young around? 
Oh, there we go. Hey, uh, Mr. Nava, members of the board, yeah. thank you for uh, the opportunity to share about the elementary process and where we are with that. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, I think we're all with you on this. I think it's fair to say um, the looks of the faces of parents and teachers is the same, which is, please, is there any way we could get back to school? Um, you know, with early literacy, it is just difficult for us to see kids progressing as they need to. You know, distance learning, um, it is some major gaps that we're seeing in participation. Uh, I think the task force is uh, at the same place, wanting to go back to some kind of normal, whatever that might look like. I know in our discussions, um, I think with a lot of great input, we came to a place feeling like the, it, it, I mean, it's not the best option. It's, it's the least bad option would be half the students come on like a Monday, Tuesday with a Wednesday break in the middle. And then the other half would come on a Thursday, Friday. That would allow PE and music to have, um, participation and uh, provide support for our students as well. And it would allow face-to-face -face contact so that we can continue uh, supporting our students, even though it's lacking a lot. Um, but we, re if we had to, because of requirements, we would choose that model as far as the fit, we'd call it the 50% model. 50% of the students come on Monday and Tuesday, and then the other 50% on a Thursday, Friday, with Wednesday in between. You know, we can't get around the challenges of elementary school students and being sanitary. I wish they didn't touch their noses and faces and, and you know, every wall in the entire school. We would have to do a lot of training. We would have to come up with procedures and routines for sure, and they would look different at each school site. But I would definitely say if we had to go to another model, that was where we were with consensus. But the true consensus was we desperately need our kids back in school with the routines and the procedures and the face-to-face -face contact with their teachers. Thank you, Mr. Young, for your input there. Uh, I agree 100%, especially at the elementary level. I don't perceive too many problems at the high school level because of the maturity or the middle school. But at the elementary level, my gosh, uh, when you have all these K through three students in the, in the classroom, how are you gonna separate them? How are you gonna have masks for them? They will never wear a mask. Uh, and if they do, they'll take it off and touch each other. So there's a lot of problems over the elementary school. I'm really concerned about those. I'm, I'm concerned that uh, the, the education system, and it's not by choice, it's not gonna be the best for this country or this state or for anybody that uses any of these models. Uh, we will try to get the maximum of them and, and this, this, this task force has worked really hard into getting the most most uh, available time for our students and and the best times that we could have them with the circumstances that we are right now so i would like uh, again uh, i like the proactive uh, action that we have uh, like i said in the, in the next week when the superintendent comes with some guidance it might be changed completely and we have to do something else but we are prepared for anything like that to happen Again, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for your input on all this. And uh, Mr. Dawson, Mr. Heinrichs, all, all the members there. Now, I'm going to open this up to the audience. Uh, do we have somebody, Mark, with questions? Uh, people that are, are going to ask questions? Yes, we do. We have a, probably about 12 people. OK, is this Valerie? Yes. Okay, Valerie, could you take them in order then? Yes, our first person would be Sabrina Maston Hill. Okay, Miss Hill. Hi. Hi. Am I, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. 
Um, so first I want to say I, I'm so glad I, I chimed into this meeting. I heard a lot of good information, and it sounds like, you know, a lot of you have the, the same concerns that I do. Um, I have two elementary school children. One of them is going into the third grade, so he's truly <laughs> elementary school. Um, I have a lot of concerns regarding um, how how would that how would the PPE be enforced? How would the six foot of distance be enforced? I have a very social. He went to his friend's house. Um, I have a very special child. Um, he uh, cannot he cannot stand being away from his friends at any amount of time. He's a, he's a hugger. He's a hugger, and he is a boy, and he always touches his face. So, how what disciplinary measures are going to be? put in place to enforce these new standards that um, are going to be occurring. Um, I also wonder um, about the, the accountability that I heard mentioned. I wonder if, I mean, how that's going to work. I know in, in my household, I work from home a couple of days, but I'm in the office rest of the week. So when I'm in the office, my children are in the care of my mom and my mom is not going to monitor their schoolwork as I do while I'm also trying to work. <laughs> um, it's so how does that, how does that work for, for people in, in my situation and for people who are, or, you know, children who are in situations where there is not be a caregiver at all who is, has the capacity to um, enforce them, them, their accountability at home. Also, I heard that uh, something really important that was mentioned regarding, you know, if they're, they're expected to not learn 100% of what they would be learning, they would be learning about 50% of that. That poses a lot of challenges for children who are already struggling for, for ESL or um, stuff like, this, like was mentioned. Um, but like I said, a lot of this stuff was covered, um, and I'm I'm glad I was able to to listen to it. So that's, that's what I have. Oh, hypersanitization and lowering immune systems. We may be worried about COVID now, but further on down the road, you know, we end up with what's called clean baby syndrome and, and we have to worry about the common cold. And these are just, these are just concerns. Um, I, but like I said, I feel a lot better having listened to everybody's thoughts on, on this topic. And uh, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Do you do you need some answers to this? I, I think that the, the the task force will take these questions into consideration when we right. go into planning. Right. That's that's all I was asking. Thank you. No answers now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Valerie. Next. Uh, going in line, we have Michelle Oregon. Michelle. Well, good evening, President Nava, uh, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Washer, and um, task force panelists. Um, first, a big, huge thank you to everyone who served on um, all three of those task forces. And, um, you know, in between their teaching times and Zooming with their kids, um, I, I know it was a huge endeavor to make those meetings and have. Um, a good representation and your voice heard. So thank you first to those members. Um, two, I think we do need um, other um, perspectives of um, some concerns that maybe um, we as a teacher or we as an administrator um, might not think of. Um, you know, I have shared my concerns um, about preschool and CTE and special ed not being represented on the task force. Um, I do know that they held a meeting day before for CTE and this morning for preschool. Um, but I, I really think that um, 
it is vitally important that we have special ed representatives from all three levels, um, PE um, and music, um, preschool and CTE also weighing in on some of these plans as we start narrowing the focus, because I think it's it's vitally important, you know, thinking about a PE class outside, um, how, how can we do that? And in talking to a couple of PE teachers, they've strategized, you know, what um, it could look like with just um, sending out um, some of the plans and them getting uh, their eyes on it. Um, I wanna thank uh, Sabrina Hill, the parent that just talked, um, and assure her that, you know, the teachers definitely would be working alongside you as a, a, a person teaching your child life skills and hand washing and distancing and good manners. Um, I think they have been undertaking that task in this new distance learning and um, new digital citizenship and how to be on a Zoom meeting and the appropriate way to answer your teacher or your, your fellow classmate. Um, it's It's been a great jump um, for teachers and what they're doing. Um, as Lisa did preface about the safety issues, we are still very concerned about um, the safety issues um, that have been raised in the past, what we heard at the previous two safety committee meetings. Um, we know that we have a safety meeting um, tomorrow and look forward to hearing about, um, you know, hopefully plans in place and cleaning. Um, but, you know, we've t talked several times at some of um, the, the three different meetings about offering choice. Um, and I think it was um, Mr. Porter that talked about um, making sure that we honor those parents that really um, don't want to bring their child to school right away. And um, I've heard that several of our private schools have um, you know, said, we will, we will take care of your kids all day. We will keep them here. Um, and we have those parents that are contacting um, us saying, we're afraid to bring back our kids to school. How safe will it be? So we really want to make sure that we, we address all those parent um, questions that teachers are getting about the start of the school year. And maybe it's time to, um, send out a survey to parents um, and get an idea, you know, tomorrow's the last day in summer break, but um, teachers still have an access to many of their emails and class dojo and stuff. And if there was a, a better time, you know, tomorrow's kind of um, a, a good time to make sure before everyone starts um, shutting down their devices. Um, serve the parents what do we want how many are we looking at um but also you know we think surveying the teachers um is also important as mr neely um, alluded to you know how many teachers do we have that are of that high risk um category that are immune compromised that maybe distance learning would be the best mode of delivery for them so we hope in navigating that we work together in you know, coming up with a plan that's best for all employees. But, you know, uh, we really have asked, you know, where are our nurses on this? Um, you know, how do they feel about um, some of the plans? And um, knowing that that safety part, I guess, is coming later has been hard for us to reassure members and also parents, um, you know, we do know that grading was, you know, this hold harmless that we went through. Uh, we hope that, you know, we expressed to parents that yes, we think grading is vitally important, it is a shortened time. How do, as Mr. Neely has done digital teaching before, you can still um, teach and assess and it is changing up things. So we do ask about plans of you know, professional development and whether the teacher's gonna do distance learning and how do we norm the distance learning to the um, in class and the amount of time. We also want to make sure that that accountability and attendance 
that we bridge that equity gap and that it isn't just the kids that, um, you know, have to be there for babysitting, but that it's a bridge of, you know, they're a class together. Um, there was talk as um, Ms. Heinrich explained about videotaping, live streaming, um, you know, the synchronous um, digital teaching is something new to many of Lodi teachers. So we would hope that we'd give teachers the opportunity to um, look at that and look at how to move forward. So um, in that lesson planning, in looking at how do colleges do it, um, those lab requirements that, that high school kids need. You know, I know that we have several um, teachers that were on the high school that talked about making videos and putting them online for everyone. And um, the summer school being our trial kind of period. So how are we reflecting on that? Um, are we, is this task force going to expand? Are they gonna meet during summer? Um, we know that there are missing pieces. You know, what's the governor gonna say? What's the federal government gonna say? And we know that as soon as we open school, um, all of our special ed things in, go back into place. So we want to be very cautious as to do we have all the stakeholders inputting and working together towards that, that, that piece. And uh, very important, I think, to make sure that everyone um, has had an opportunity um, to kind of share um, their concerns and maybe it's somebody didn't think about something. There was a lot of concern over the Fridays um, turning into staff meeting days um, on the task force. So I heard Mr. Neely say Wednesday kind of worked out better because maybe somebody would take a weekend um, early. That's possible, but on the same thing, we also really value the time to plan and not that it's an extension, we can't burn our teachers out. We know they've given a thousand percent on this distance learning and, and it's time for a break, but we also feel it's time to reflect on what worked, what didn't work, and going forward with PD, how do we address those teachers that need something different? And as we move forward um, with you know, our learn strong, teach strong, there's been a different format on that. But we also know there's other things like all of the Keenan videos and more PD on coronavirus that we'll have to see. So we hope that all of those things with this first study session have has shy, shown a light on the many aspects and hope that we have continued discussion with more stakeholders. I really hope um, nurses and our CSEA and secretaries um, are also um, getting an opportunity to say something on how this looks um, for them. So thank you for the opportunity to talk and the opportunity of the task forces. I have to let you know that other districts um, are not quite where we are. So in starting this, I think we're ahead of the game in some ways. Let's just make sure that we um, don't stall and, and keep asking questions and having people give input. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, Valerie, who's next? We have Deborah Ladwig. Deborah, you're on, Deborah. Good evening, President Nava, members of the board and Superintendent Washer. Um, I think you can hear me. You can, you bet. Excellent, excellent. Um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Freitas for acknowledging um, the absence of CSEA representation during uh, at the task force meetings. Um, and also, in, during the presentation, I noticed in the executive summary that <clears throat> it does state that concerns regarding disinfecting, hand washing, meal preparation, transportation, the things that are generally covered by the classified school employees um, are gonna be addressed by their appropriate departments. So I would ask 
that you please relay whatever the information is that's being shared with the departments to the employees of those departments. Because since we aren't asked to be part of the task force, our employees, we are completely in the dark. I, am, I have to answer the phone every single day to people asking whether or not we are going to have school after July 1st. Because our, the people who are CSEA members are very concerned. They don't believe there's going to be school. They don't believe they're going to have a job. So if we could get some information out to our folks about the plans that are in place or the plans that are in the works, even just some reassurance that there are plans in the works and we don't know exactly what things are going to look like and that more information will be forthcoming, I think it will allay a lot of the fears of our classified employees who just feel very disenfranchised right now and do not believe that there's going to be work come July 1st. Um, but I, I know that the task force has done a lot of work and I think that most of the work that they have done, um, while it would, it would have been great information for CSEA to have, we probably wouldn't have been able to add anything to the discussion because we are not the people who deliver the instruction. And a lot of what's been going on since this is about the delivery of instruction. So I don't, I don't want to say, you know, shame on you for not having us there, but I really think if we're going to move forward and we're going to be making plans about what school might look like, or even the fact that there will be school, it would, it would help us a lot if we could be involved so that we could assure our members that yes, there are things that are going on. So if you're, if you're not going to have a CSEA member on the task force, that's fine. But when the departments are included and the departments receive information, we would ask that it be disseminated to everyone in their department so that the employees of the departments know what's coming down and can understand that yes, there is going to be some type of instruction come July 1st. There is going to be school. Lay Unified is not going to fold up their tent and go away. We just don't know what it's going to look like. Um, other than that, I thank you all for all the work that you've done and have a good evening. Thank you, Deborah. Mr. Mr. Valerie, how many, how many more do we have? De uh, Valerie? Mr. Nava. Mr. Nava? Yes, Mr. Porter? I just have a point of clarification. Uh, I believe on the task force, and I might be incorrect, but Lori Bryant was present. She's a member of CSEA. And I believe that a counselor from Bear Creek was present. She's a member of LPPA. So there were people there on the task force that represented those different groups. Thank you, Mr. Porter, for the info. Uh, Valerie, how many more do we have? Uh, we have about eight. Okay, let's put them on. Next. Next one is Nicole Shampoo. Nicole, you're, you're on. Okay, and she has now left. So we have Jacqueline Heinrich. I'm out. Jacqueline? I I'm out. I didn't know how to get my mic open for the meeting. So I signed up both ways. Sorry. Okay, next. Carol Marceau. Carol Marceau. Uh, hi to all of you and thank you for having us here. I've really in, uh, appreciated listening to you all this evening. And I think that the task force is, it sounds like they've done a really good job kind of getting to this place and addressing a lot of things. I really uh, liked what I heard a lot of tonight. Uh, as we go forward, I think that once a basic structure is in place, uh, um, something that gives us teachers as much face time with students as possible, um, maybe the task force could be expanded a little bit to include some specialty stakeholders like myself who is a VAPA and a CTE teacher. And, and we in those departments have some special needs in that, you know, there's a lot of materials involved. There's a lot of hands-on and equipment issues that are gonna be needing to be addressed at that time. But um, I appreciate you having me speak tonight. I don't really have anything to ask specifically. I, I felt that a lot of my questions were answered as best as they could be tonight. 
So thank you. Thank you, Carol. All right, Valerie. India Bryant. No, and she has dropped off. We have a okay. um, parent by the name of Melissa. Melissa? Melissa around? Is Melissa there? Mm -hmm. Melissa Williams? Okay, I guess. Right. Melissa Williams, go ahead, please. Right. Melissa? We're listening. I can hear her, but I, she's not listening to us. So we will move on to Donald Zavala. Donald, you're on. He has dropped off also. Okay. We now have Jessica Kempler. Jessica. Thank you, President Nava, members of the board and Dr. Washer. Um, I wear two hats in our district as I'm a parent and an employee. Um, and I just had a couple of comments that I wanted to make sure were heard on both sides. As a parent, I don't want to discredit any of the work that our teachers did in this fourth quarter because they've done an amazing job with all of our students having to quickly transition um, to this new distance learning and figure out what that was going to look like for all of their students and what their various access levels were. Um, but my sister does in-home daycare. So we had eight students that had essential employee parents that were still in our home during this last fourth quarter. And I just wanted to acknowledge that there was a disparity in the way that instruction was offered to students in different grade levels, in different classrooms, in different school sites. Um, and I would like to hope that moving forward, there would be um, a framework for lack of a better description um, offered for what the expectations are for distance learning to make sure that each student is getting an equitable opportunity to the materials that they're missing from not being in a classroom. Um, it was a fantastic opportunity in a lot of ways. My son specifically was able to work a lot faster in math than he would have been able to in the classroom. Um, but again, we are missing some of the supports that we do get in a classroom. So I will be excited to see our students start to go back. Um, but as if distance learning is gonna remain in any form and with these 50% models and 25% models, I anticipate there's still being a distance learning portion on the days the students will not be present. I would just hope that there will be some framework of what those days should look like to create some equitability across classrooms and grade levels and schools in our district. Um, as a working parent, not necessarily even an employee in the district, but an employee as well, I hope that some consideration is taken as we're looking at these different models for what parents are gonna be expected to overcome if students are not attending school full-time. Um, as an employee of the district myself, am I gonna be expected to come to work all five days if my student is only going to work or only going to school for two? But that's not even just a district employee question, that's an every working parent question. We understand that the best is being done to get our students back in school as quickly and as often as possible. Um, but I hope for some acknowledgement of the hardships it's gonna create for us um, with our limited incomes or just our family situations of two full-time working parents or a single parent on that childcare that's gonna be required for students not going to school all day or every day. So thank you, that's all I had. Thank you, Jessica. Valerie next. Lori Salis. Lori? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I wrote a letter today and I'm not sure if you received it, but I wanted to, as a teacher, address um, if we cannot go back full time with a student. So I've had the opportunity to look at several scenarios uh, to open school. And I have some thoughts about what might be successful. I believe that the model that would work best would be an AB alternating model where students are grouped into two groups. A group attends in school, um, school in person on Monday and Wednesday, and B group attends in person Tuesday and Thursday. Fridays, all st students will learn remotely 
and teachers plan distance learning for the following week. And I know that Mr. Um, Neely said something about having it on Wednesday. And initially I thought I didn't have a preference Wednesday or Friday, but then I do believe that Friday would actually be better um, because if I'm planning for the next week, I have Friday to set up my distance learning plan. Um, and on the days that the students are not face-to-face -face in school, I can see that they're provided lessons by the teacher to enhance and extend the learning introduced at school. So, Monday, for example, Monday's group at home, the at-home learners will be front-loaded with Tuesday's in-person lessons. Monday's in-person learners will be provided extensions on Tuesday for what they learn on Monday. So I would personally do this through Google Classroom, a slide deck and walk them through their learning for the day. And then this will be repeated Wednesday and Thursday. I can also see PE and music will be on alternating week basis. So there'd be an X week and a Y week with the school split down the middle. So classrooms, um, throughout the school will be divided in half and those on an X week will receive PE in person and music remotely. And those on a Y week will receive music in person and PE remotely. And that would ensure that the students are provided their much needed and required in the case of PE classes. And in this time, my belief is that music and PE are critical for their emotional, social emotional health. I thought it would be, um, easier for parents to plan for than, um, for example, the AMPM model. Um, and then also it must alternate in my opinion to provide continuity of follow-up by the teacher as, a, as opposed to say group A coming Monday and Tuesday and then group B coming Wednesday, Thursday. So I feel like that structure has too long of a stretch um, of time without teacher contact. So I've also read some models that split the day, and here's the problems that I see with those models. First, no matter how careful our schedule is, there will be overlap of students and the midday dismissal arrival time. Many students have to wait to be picked up anyways, and many sometimes are late. So this would mean that students and parents will be crossing paths much more than we desire at that time. And parking lot issues would be horrendous as well. And I'm gonna pause also, um, I'm speaking just for elementary. I'm a third grade teacher. So um, there's also the quick turnaround where the classroom must be sanitized. And I don't believe it's possible that in the small window of time for custodians to adequately clean doorknobs, bathrooms, tables, etc. So that that duty would fall on the teachers who are also trying to dismiss, attend to students not being picked up, eat lunch and set up engaging lessons and be ready to teach the arriving students. And often to students right now, they show up a half an hour early to school. So there's also that issue. And there's also the fact that we don't really know how long this virus lasts in the air. And with such a short turnaround, um, the morning students could very well infect the afternoon group. Uh, it just sounds like a logistical nightmare to me. So I'm of the belief that we need to act quickly on this in order for parents and teachers to prepare no matter what we decide. And I want to say that I would much rather teach in what we call now a normal school year, but I accept that will not probably happen in, right now. So actually, I have to admit, I'm a little excited to attempt to teach this way because I have some great ideas on how I can make it work. And honestly, if I divide myself, my class in half, I'll have 12 students. And I truly believe I can move faster with those students. I teach students to read. And if I have 12 for the entire day, I really believe that I can make those students um, move faster. I can make more progress. So I thank you so much for your time. Very good. Thank you very much, Lori. Uh, next, Valerie. That concludes the list that have registered for comments. That concludes. I want to thank every speaker for their input. I'm sure that the task force listened to it and will take a lot of those things into consideration. I'd like to have Mr. Khan finish it up. Mr. Khan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Navo, members of the board, Dr. Washer. I, um, I can certainly echo um, the, the feelings of many that I hope that for those uh, students and families that do wish to return to normal, 
Um, I hope that we can get them there soon and also accommodate the distance learners. Um, my hope stems from a, a different angle. Um, the board's uh, students and even their staff to some extent will be graded on a, um, a report card of sorts that spans the course of a semester, a quarter, um, maybe a year. But the, the staff members providing the services offered by business services will be graded on a report card that's, that's uh, scored every single day. And I'd like to go over um, some of those items. So um, if we're to use all classrooms, uh, standard California classrooms, 960, 960 square feet, which mathematically means um, in theory that, uh, that that space would house 16 individuals. That would include staff. I would um, dare say that um, the furniture, the, the counter space might reduce that number. Um, in terms of disinfecting it every day, the um, protocol that would be most likely is our Clorox 360 uh, product. That would uh, run the board about $4 a day in material per classroom but it would likely require upwards of two custodians daily to, to get through a very large site, a medium site, perhaps smaller sites can be done by one, one staff member. Um, while it in theory, maybe soap and paper towels would become a more costly item for the district, I think that would all depend on whether or not we can actually procure supplies of hand sanitizer. I think if that were to come to pass, and thus far we have been entirely unsuccessful um, obtaining any hand sanitize sanitizer, then uh, costs would probably increase markedly because of hand sanitizer, but um, that might offset soap and paper towel um, usage just due to the ease of use of hand sanitizer. Uh, mask and gloves for employees and students. Uh, if we reckon a mask, a temporary mask is a dollar um, uh, per mask, gloves maybe a quarter uh, per pair. This would run well in, into the six million, seven million dollar expenditure level for an entire year. Um, it would probably be more likely to um, uh, maybe expect or encourage those who can to bring um, reusable cloth, washable masks, and then maybe the district could provide um, cloth masks uh, along the same lines that we might provide a PE outfit for a child that um, forgot, forgot theirs during the day. Um, nutrition, I think, is, is something that can accommodate um, this type of environment, social distancing and, um, and other, whatever other restrictions are, are involved in, in a COVID-19 um, program, but it, it, the, the nutrition service itself would change. Rather than having salad bars and warm meals, it would likely move toward, more towards bag lunches that would be consumed maybe in a classroom and here's where we start getting a, a little bit of um, um, push and pull. If we begin feeding in classrooms to reduce the, the congregations of students in say an NPR or cafeteria, now we're increasing the, the loads of custodians who are also required to come in and disinfect classrooms um, periodically throughout a day. Um, but nonetheless, I think food could be um, provided to those who attended during the day to answer Mr. Freitas's um, concern. I think if we, we might be able to even stage a pickup for those who don't attend during the, during the day. And I think our, um, our nutrition services staff under Director Rostamelia have absolutely proved their, their ability to do uh, both of those things over the last several months. Um, Transportation is, is gonna be a very difficult service to provide in an environment where 
student days are cut up and and into halves and quarters. Um, CD, I don't know whether they opine this or whether it's a direction, but I do know that they have um, stated that for an 84 passenger bus under a social distancing regime, uh, maximum capacity would be 15 kits. Um, wow. If we run a 54 um, passenger bus, that would be maximum of 12. So we are talking in, in no uncertain terms of quadrupling the amount of routes to maintain current uh, transportation um, levels. And we simply don't have the buses or the staff members. Uh, to the extent that we can provide additional routes during the day with um, uh, uh, transportation federal transportation regulations, that being a driver may not be on the clock for more than 16 hours or behind the wheel any time more than 10 hours per day. Um, if we could increase the number of um, routes or rotations throughout the day, it would certainly limit transportation to things like um, athletic events, field trips, and um, other uh, co-curricular activities. Um, while, again, we hope that, um, that we can return to normal as soon as humanly possible, um, from the business angle, I hope we look at all, all, all possible options, even including um, for the time that we spend as a nation until a vaccine is developed, altering the, the calendar and the vacation times within the calendar, maybe to um, offset those peak infection months during, during a calendar year. But we, we do have a lot of concerns about any type of altered program. I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Malvo. Any questions from the board? I think you covered everything thoroughly there, Mr. Khan. Give us a lot of information. Uh, all, all we know, all we, where is the money coming from? Well, the, the short answer is it's not. We're, we're on, on, the, on, the, on the one hand, we're, we're probably going to have to increase cost to support a, um, a socially distanced program. On the other hand, the state's going to be taking better than 30 million, to, at least in terms of the May revise um, projections. Um, the state's going to be taking better than 30 million dollars a year from us for the foreseeable future. Thank you, sir. Any, any other questions? Any questions for Mr. Khan? Okay, I want to thank everybody for attending. Thank you. Uh, audience for attending and listening to all the um, the models that we have here and uh, thank the, all the task force for putting all their time in and coming up with some some great ideas uh, again uh, this is only a presentation for future future needs and we will see what the superintendent of public instruction comes out with in the next two weeks uh, whether we have to change or plan directions to plan something else uh thank you lisa for your hard work and uh i'm, I'm sure i'm not gonna butter you up because you're still you're still here till the 12th so uh we will see you on the 2nd of june again okay so that's our next board meeting appreciate that if uh dr washer you have any closing statements Greatly appreciate uh, board members participation thank you to all the uh, members of the public who commented Really appreciate Lisa and her team for all their work and for giving a, a very concise and thorough presentation. Thank you also, Leonard Kahn. And that's it for us tonight. We will continue this conversation and bring it back another time. Thank you very much, Dr. Washer. May I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second motion by Mr. Herberly, second by Mr. Nini to adjourn the meeting. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting adjourned, see you board on the 2nd of June.
Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Have a nice evening. Adios.